the memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine. Castles on the run, the person 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 on the run, the the run, the 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 uh, we'll get started. Our next speaker is Rebecca Gray. She's going to be talking about uh, aging with multiple sclerosis. And she is a program and services specialist with the uh, National Multiple Sclerosis Society in San Antonio. So give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the um, VA and the uh, Health Science Center and for inviting us today. This is our first uh, time I heard uh, Dr. Saunders say that this program's been going on for, what, 30 years? <laughs> Gee, I'm missing it. Um, and I'm, I'm your audience. Um, I, uh, he said that my name is Rebecca. I work for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society here in San Antonio. I have about 20 years, exper over 20 years experience in working for nonprofit. So if you are uh, looking at my name and you're looking at me and you're going, I know her from somewhere. Uh, I used to I started at the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and uh, and then I spent 11 years at the American Lung Association. So your kid your kid could have gone to asthma camp or we sat on an environmental coalition together. Uh, I've been around a, a long time. Uh, and if you don't know me, you're going to know me after today. So I brought plenty of business cards and you've got uh, some handouts that they gave you. So we'll make friends. Um, so let's just uh, move on and get going here. Let's see. Oh, wrong one. There we go. So learning objectives, got to have those. I really want you to know um, more about multiple sclerosis at the society. We're always talking about MS awareness, so let's uh, let's get a dive into that topic, and then of course discuss access to care uh, for individuals with MS and their families, um, and how they can get uh, access through you, uh, you the clinicians and community resources. And then uh, a lot of resources that we have that you may not have even known that um, we did and how we support the uh, healthcare professional. So uh, those are, if I get that done, I'm, I'm driving with all intensity here. So uh, mission statement, uh, people affected by MS can live their best lives as we stop MS in its track restore what has been lost and end MS forever. Uh, these three books, I meant to use my pointer, uh, stop, restore, end, those are our three words that we live by at the society. Um, a lot of people will tell me I don't care if I don't get any, I, I don't care about the disease as long as I don't get any worse. Uh, but it sure would be great if I could rebound and gain some strength back. And I don't want my children um, uh, to have this disease uh, or any family member. So stop, restore, end are their three words. So a uh, definition of MS. Here's what you'll love. A neurodegenerative autoimmune disease of the central nervous system characterized by recurrent episodes of inflammation and demyelination followed by loss of axons and neurons. That sounds fun. How about this? MS is an autoimmune inflammatory destructive disease that attacks the central nervous system and interferes with the brain's ability to send and receive messages. That kind of encapsulates it a little bit better. And then um, what I have to tell people is it's an unpredictable disease. 
and every twist and turn is unpredictability. So I came on staff with the MS Society in 2007. I admit it, I'm a baby boomer. Um, when I was first interviewing, I was thinking about, okay, what do I know before you go and you do a little study and what we all do, your big interview. So I, being with MDA, I knew about neuromuscular diseases, but I didn't know anything about autoimmune diseases. And the one person that, you know, we're, again, baby boomer, who, who do I know that has MS? Uh, this young lady popped in my mind, Annette Funicello. And even today, uh, when people are diagnosed, there's always some great aunt or grandmother or somebody else. Oh yeah, that's the disease that Annette had. And of course, we remember what Annette looked like. She was, um, you know, she died about two years ago. And I know that um, prior to that, you know, you'd see pictures of her on different um, magazines and things when you're checking out at HEB and you go, oh my Lord, what happened to Annette? But let's think about Annette a little bit because Annette was diagnosed long before we had the medications and the treatments that we have today, long before MRIs. She probably had to present with two body parts before she could even get anybody to listen to her that something's going on. I, did, I didn't do long research on her, but I, I do know that even when she was doing the um, beach uh, movies with Frankie Avalon, she at some point said that she couldn't stand up and people were saying that she was drunk and what's wrong with you. So she had the symptoms a long, long time before she was actively um, diagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she also um, came out and told people that she had MS before the first medication was even available in 1993. So we can't really think, well, everybody's going to have the same outcome as Annette did. Uh, living with MS in 2015 is a lot different. We have uh, Montel Williams. We have Ann Romney, and my personal favorite, Clay Walker. So now you're thinking, yeah, but the patients that I see don't look like Clay Walker. What's the difference here? Well, the medications came out. And it's a lot of things. The medications came out in 93. Uh, today we have, I think, still like uh, five injectables, three oral medications, two infusion medications, and one of them, one of the infusions is brand new, came out last November, and it's as close to a cure as we have. Uh, and that's, we're just so delighted about this explosion of treatments and medications. Um, but we're also forgetting that 20 years ago we didn't have that little clause, where we had that little clause that said pre-existing condition. Fortunately that's gone, but we still have the residue. We have the individuals that did not get medical care. Maybe they got the diagnosis, um, but they were not getting we were not able to keep their health insurance long enough to get the medication um, drilled down to the one that works for them. Uh, maybe they lost their jobs. Maybe they went uh, to um, Social Security early. Um, many, many things happened. Um, that is now, pre we're seeing now as our individuals that were diagnosed 20 years ago or in their 50s. Uh, just a little bit epidemiology here. Uh, more women have MS than men, about three to one, and that correlates uh, directly with your autoimmune. More women get autoimmune diseases than men do. Uh, most common neurological disability in young adults. 70% um, manifest uh, symptoms between the ages of 21 and 40. Um, we are seeing people manifest MS later in life. We're not sure why that is, but um, could be just the 
our diagnostic ability is drilling down and getting to it. Uh, or maybe they, they've had it for many years and nobody picked up on it. Um, 2.1 million worldwide and about 500,000 in the U.S. It's not a reportable disease, so we'll never have 100% accurate numbers. It's very expensive uh, compared with direct uh, all-cost medical costs. It ranks second behind uh, congestive heart failure. All these wonderful medications and treatments I was just telling you about. 8,500 to 54,000 annually per person. And national costs are over 8 billion. Um, talking about the person over 50 with MS, 72% um, of them are gonna be female, and that correlates with their peers. 92% uh, Caucasian, 44% have graduated. Uh, marital status, I wasn't able to get a good, um, just that 25% were widows. Uh, again, because I work here locally. Yes, sir. Could you possibly ask them to turn their mic yeah. off? Kind of, I, I, I can't do that. Can you just say it in the mic? Say it in the mic. In the microphone. Yeah. Please turn your mic off. Is that it? And this is the and Mark, what else do we have to do? Please turn your mic off. Detail site, please turn your mic off. Detail site, please turn your mic off. Yeah. Yeah. You think we got it? No. 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 <laughs> if, if you press on. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, and thank you for that. Because I'm new here, so how did I know that? That I, I had control. Um, I don't have a good um, uh, number for divorced, like Dr. Saunders had, uh, or better number. But um, working at the society and working with the many cases that I have over the last year, uh, over the last eight years, I can tell you that I have a lot of women that are divorced, multiple sclerosis and marriage are not as compatible as it should be. They, it's, it's a difficult disease to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And so marriages that were maybe a little fractured before the chronic disease hit uh, really breaks down. So I've got a lot of women that uh, report that they're divorced and um, have very little family in uh, Living alone, Obviously, if you're down to, you know, we're a society, it takes two incomes. And uh, so if you um, have a chronic disease, you're living alone, you're probably living on a little social security, um, or what little job you have, you're barely hanging on to. Um, let's see what else I want to talk about here. Um, in your older population, you're going to see people that will report that they've been living with multiple, cirrhos multiple cirrhosis for longer than 20 years. Um, there was a time we used to say that, uh, if you know anything about MS, the initial uh, diagnosis is relapsing or admitting. You come back to baseline, you have an exacerbation, come back to baseline. And then there's a more progressive form. Uh, and time-wise, we used to say that they would, uh, could, would probably stay in the workforce about 10 years and then um, have to leave or do something different, try to find some maybe part-time work. Um, but now, because of these medications and they've been so good, uh, people are staying in that uh, relapsing remitting uh, or just moving into secondary longer, uh, being diagnosed maybe 15 years. So that's good, that's a real good thing. Um, and then I said also that we do have people that are being diagnosed in their 50s. So we've got both going. Um, and two-thirds of those that are, again, over 20 years with the disease, they may have the more progressed form. It's unpredictable. There's no um, looking glass that I can, or little a box that I can wave at and go, oh, yeah, 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 I know exactly how your disease is going to go. We can't, we don't know. Um, the common reported uh, symptoms, pain, fatigue, uh, balance and weakness. The, the, um, they're more sensitive to the, some of the side effects, 
probably because of the metabolism part as we age. Um, and then some of the overlapping symptoms of normal aging and MS, so we have to get all of that, tease those out. Uh, diminished muscle strength. Um, visual changes. A lot of people were originally diagnosed because of a, uh, a really amazing one day they woke up and they couldn't see out of part of their eye um, and they had discarded all of those other balance problems that they had been having. But that usually gets you to the doctor. Uh, alterations in bowel and bladder. Um, cognitive impairment is huge. And then osteoporosis possibly because of all the steroids that they've been taking through the years and sleep disturbances. So what you have to do as a clinician is kind of tease out, is it the MS or is it just them getting older? But these are some of the things that we see a lot anyway, even in that younger person. Person with MS and the elderly, um, high number of urinary tract infections, again, that goes back to their um, bladder problems. Um, <clears throat> pneumonia, septicemia, cellulitis, um, and their non-MS peers, they have more angina, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, like Dr. Saunders did, your um, diabetes and uh, pulmonary disease. These, um, your, your patients that have MS, you need to screen them for all of this normal stuff, but um, you also need to strongly, strongly, strongly encourage them if they're obese or overweight to lose weight. <coughs> it's not going to be good for them in their long term. And um, stop smoking. <laughs> stop smoking. Now, when I came to work for the society in 2007, I could not believe how many people I encountered that smoked, that had MS, and how my colleagues, my peers at the society, refused to say a word. Now the, um, and I wasn't shy because I came from American Lung, um, but now the research is catching up, and uh, we know that um, autoimmune diseases follow that person that's overweight and also who smokes. So it's the precursor. We can't change what is, but we can change what's going forward or have to try to alter what's going forward. The other thing that researchers are telling us is that all those very expensive medications, if you're a smoker, they're less effective. So again, you're not doing yourself any um, good by ignoring this person that comes to see you every couple of months and they're still smoking. You need to bring it up. Um, physical functioning, you're going to see that person uh, that needs more assistance on their daily activities. Um, also, you're going to see that they're probably going to need some caregiving support um, and also in a lot of other things like, you know, um, housework, uh, transportation, obviously, dressing, all of those things. And as Dr. Saunders pointed out, we're going to be getting a lot of this caregiver support from our families. So that's another reason that the family can potentially break down. Um, it says here is using assistive devices. Um, this is where I come on the other side. I want people to use more assistive devices if they have MS. I want them to, because they're so tired all the time, I want them to maximize their, um, um, their day. And if using the walker does it, then let's do it. Also, if they're living alone, then they're all very high risk of falls. And a person with MS that has a fall can spiral them to a rehab hospital, nursing home. And I've got quite a few people that that's happened to. And we can't, once they're laying around, um, they, it, rebounding and coming back is very, very, very difficult. I won't say it's impossible, but it takes a lot of work. Um, this one, psychological functioning. I love this one. Um, okay, so here's the partner that's saying, look who it is. Um, yep, he, 
um, the fella says, I'm doing the best I can. It's all I can do. And she says, yeah, but all you did was get out of bed. So this is, and I think they have a little old joke. We love our caregivers because that's the only way the bed would get made. Um, this happens a lot. And it may even happen to you if you're thinking, um, well, they walked in here fine. Um, they should be fine. But um, it's all the inner turmoil that's going on. So I have so many people that tell me I've got, I'm tired. Uh, I go to bed at night. I wake up. I'm, I'm just getting dressed. It's exhausting. So, and this is very difficult for the family member because um, they want this person to be more with it. And so if there's clashes. It also um, could be all of this fatigue is also linked uh, right to their depression. Uh, they feel helpless. Uh, they have a hard time expressing themselves. Uh, this cognition problem is very high with people that have multiple sclerosis. It seems that anecdotally, if they have more lesions in their upper brain, they're going to have more uh, cognitive problems. If they have more lesions in their um, spine, then they typically may uh, present with more ambulatory problems. And then we've got those that have both. Um, the problem is, is that once they're in the doctor's office or they're with you, they may not, uh, you may not be able to drill down to the depression part, but you've got to put it higher up. And I know Dr. Saunders uh, brought that up too. We've got to be talking more about their mental health. They won't report it uh, as frequently as, that, as, it, as they need to. It's very underreported. And um, it's not, it's the other thing that I see is that they may get antidepressants, but they also need that top therapy uh, that's missing. The uh, cognitive functioning, a little bit more on that, is that they have, top, have a difficult time um, planning and sequencing their day. Um, we have a program that uh, I took through the MS Society. It's called Solution Focused Conversations. And, um, you know, my job was to, you know, make appointments with them and find out what their priorities were and go through a list and, you know, um, get them to, you know, take action. We want to empower them, right? So once I got through the whole thing and I tried it with a couple of people, I went back to my coach and I said, we don't have anything in that program that addresses the cognition problem. Because we call back and then they say, um, gee, uh, I didn't have time because I, I got sick or I forgot to do that or I don't know where my notes are. They have very difficult time following through. And again, back to the, the partner in the, the comic, that's one, another reason why everyone is so stressed out in the home is because of the, this cognition problem and the depression really elevates the whole cycle of uh, coping. Unmet needs, um, we need more um, people to be trained to work specifically with that um, multiple sclerosis patient and um, give them uh, good physical therapy and home therapy so that they can exercise on their own. Uh, occupational therapy, I see that as a big problem as well, where they, um, how can I put it, they, they got all these devices, but they don't know how to use them. So we need to send people out in the home to teach them. Um, most of them will uh, get an eye doctor appointment every couple of years. Uh, the same with Dr. Saunders telling us dental care, really bad, very bad. And I think that it's um, maybe with all the other appointments that they have to keep up with, taking care of their mouth is, gets low priority or maybe low priority from the family or because they don't have um, that expendable income to spend on the dental care. Um, but I can tell you, uh, 20 years of uh, off and on taking steroids and some of these other medications that dry the mouth out brings their thumbs. And so I've had people tell me um, I've got, uh, I've had to have all or most of my teeth extracted and they're 45 years old. 
Um, they would love to have implants because they still have enough bone to be able to do it, but they can't afford it. So, um, and all it really would have taken is going to the dentist more often and putting that higher up on the um, on their priority list. Um, <clears throat> health insurance, uh, we're getting there, we're not there. I found that her slide was interesting um, because I've got people that just, maybe they could get to a primary care, but they can't get to their uh, subspecialist that they need. And the subspecialist obviously would be their neurologist um, and their urologist. Um, are people that are, should be higher up and it's difficult to get, um, to get them to the doctor. Even in Corpus Christi, which is, we would think is a nice big city and should have all the subspecialists they do, I don't have not one neurologist in Corpus Christi that specializes in multiple sources. So they either have to come to San Antonio or go to Houston, and the ones that have no transportation, um, they there's nothing. I At one time, I researched uh, to try to find a neurologist that was accepting new patients uh, in Corpus with uh, Medicaid. There was none. They wanted to send them to Victoria. This old man was not gonna, capable of getting on the bus and traveling to Victoria through the, that Medicaid service. So these are unmet needs, we, we, we know it. We're also looking strongly at trying to um, do more telemedicine because, I, in my opinion, that's the only way that we're going to do it. Unless you guys out there are uh, medical students. If you're a medical student here, you have a medical student in your family, send them to go see Dr. Rebecca Romero over at the Health Science Center. She's uh, the one that heads up our, um, our MS clinic here. Um, let me see if I can say this this morning. Generativity, no. Uh, volunteering, I'll use Dr. Saunders' uh, slide. Giving back. Um, actually, I wanted to touch on one thing. Wellness and health promotion, that's uh, something that the society is really working forward to bring to um, talk more about. Again, I talked about the smoking, uh, losing weight, exercise. But we've gone through this whole renaissance of trying to figure out how to address uh, wellness and health promotion at the society. And I think that um, this giving back is a huge part of uh, a person, of their whole wellness. What we know is that even, um, even if you've got a little bit of it and a person that is uh, quite uh, has a dementia to a to, um, vast degree, that person can spark up if they have any kind of encounter. So we think, I think, that it's um, adding purpose to your life is um, central. And it's very hard for people that ha are living with a chronic disease, have lived with it for a long time, to have that. Uh, that sense of purpose, they lose it. Uh, if you haven't read the book, Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, please put it on your list. Um, he explores um, where elder care is in this country, and he talks a lot about what we can do to help people have purpose. Um, encourage assistive devices, again, I'm on that side of the the um, table. Um, interdisciplinary collaborations is important, so we all have to work together. Um, caregiver support, there's a lot of good resources here in town, but we could have more. Um, practical strategies, um, you know, I when people tell me that they, um, they don't sleep at night, I ask them if they have a TV in their bedroom, and they go, yeah. <laughs> got the TV out. Uh, I asked them if they tried to go to bed at the same time at night, and they go, well, no. <laughs> so there are some practical things we can do to try to help fatigue. Easy stuff. Obviously, the eating better, getting exercise. Uh, even a little bit of exercise is better than none. Um, here, in this, here in San Antonio, we've got several free yoga classes that we offer. 
uh, weekly. So, I mean, there are some things that we can add to these uh, individuals' life and make them aware of. Um, the, these two go together, uh, cognitive and mental health assessments. Um, again, it's, if the family uh, member is perplexed uh, or about to exit the door because they're so upset with this individual that they just don't see as doing enough, uh, if they understood um, how bad the cognition was, and you do this test through a neuropsychologist, um, then I think that there could be a lot more empathy, a lot more understanding. Um, and then the um, getting everyone treatment for uh, depression is, even, even the caregiver, could be a whole blanket of things going on in it. So what do I do at the Society? Um, well, we've got three tiers of service. Uh, that first one, Tier 1, is usually um, the new diagnosed per pa patient will give us a call. And so it goes, if they call the 800 number, they're going to take um, a little information. And I just want to assure you, none of our lists are sold. It's all 100% private. Um, so we will um, we'll help them get the basic information that they have, that they want. And uh, we have programs um, that like knowledge is power to help them um, uh, understand their disease because if they read the first diagnosis, whoever, thank you. That's different. Oh, that's different. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, um, so, uh, or they'll call uh, because they want a support group. We do have local support groups. Um, they may call to get a doctor referral. We can do that. So those are, or even they're concerned about employment issues, um, discrimination in the workplace, things like that. Those are kind of, I call those your ABC calls. And even when they do filter to my desk, I'm very happy to do those. Um, but typically what will then happen is that there's really um, a bigger issue. So tier two um, is what typically comes to my office, uh, either face-to-face -face or on the phone. Some of the docs that I work with uh, will send people directly to me. Um, they, they have a, a financial problem that they need uh, help with. Maybe they were in the hospital for a week and they got behind on uh, a rent payment or mortgage payment or utility. We're one of the few um, nonprofits out there that will still do direct financial assistance. And it's at, um, as long as it has something to do with the disease, I have to eliminate the fact I can't do co-pays, I can't do uh, medications, um, but we can sometimes pay something else that will free up that money. And we have that discretion ourselves. I don't have to go through a gazillion people to, um, to get it approved. Had a woman uh, that needed to move out of her apartment, but she had no ability to pack and she had no ability to unpack. She had somebody, she had movers, but she didn't have any of that other support. Uh, we paid for that. So um, had a lady that was in New Brownfields that was coming to town for this new infusion. It's a five-day infusion. And because of family constraints in New Brownfields, she couldn't have she didn't have transportation back and forth. So I researched it, $900 for taxi service for five days, round trip, yeah. I went, well, that's a little out of reach. Um, but we did put her up at a hotel and that was considerably cheaper. So uh, those types of you know, fringe things, we, we would consider doing. Obviously, we'll do the uh, assistance with if they need a small modification in the home. Can't pay a lot, but we can pay a good chunk, and we have other resources that we can tap into. Um, Co-pays for um, assistive devices. So you know, insurance will say, well, I'll give you one wheelchair for five years. But what if they need, in addition to the power chair, they need a manual chair? Um, we can help with that. Or they need uh, a better walker than the little standard walker. We can do that. 
So there's a, a lot of things that um, we can help. And we also work with our other MS partners. Uh, for example, MSAA has a wonderful array of programs and services that they provide. Um, cooling devices, we hear that a lot, that it's so hot and that exacerbates their, uh, their MS. So um, MS Foundation and MSAA both have programs to support um, cooling garments. Um, so what happens after that? Well, our tier three is called care management, and that is the area that I call boots on the ground. That's that person that needs some kind of, um, they cannot, either they're alone and they can't navigate uh, the system to get the items that they need, or they need to make a transition to some other living arrangement. Um, Dr. Saunders talked about that her aunt did not have enough money for assisted living. I think that a lot of people just assume that that's out there and that it's paid for and it's not. So if they haven't planned appropriately for their later years, and a lot of times this hits so early that they use all their resources, um, transitioning is a huge uh, issue and it needs, um, it needs boots on the ground, it needs somebody in the home. Here locally we um, uh, contract with Accountable Aging and if uh, a name, if Spencer Brown comes up, he's, I talk to him frequently. And we have a, a care manager um, director that handles all of our cases. I'm, I'm part of a region of five states, so we're very, very busy. <clears throat> So those are the three things. Um, basically, our job is to help navigate people through all the resources and, when necessary, um, get very involved. What we don't want to do is call APS prematurely because um, that is it's very disruptive um, for, for everyone. Um, what else do we do? Um, well, you've got to search our website because um, if you're looking for any topic, it's there. And we have a whole subset just for the healthcare professional. And, um, and then, of course, we do provide the direct support to families and, um, and individuals with MS. And I, just, I did bring a bucket with me with a lot of items. I just want to show you a few of them. Now these are to support you. Um, I brought a lot of these, if anybody wants them. These are actually little flash drives, and they have all of the information um, for, that we would give to an individual with MS if they had a specific, because there's just so many topics, you know, fatigue and depression and rehab and uh, alternative medicine, and uh, there's so many things. But we have a ton of support for the healthcare professional. Um, for example, and if you take one of these, you'll have to take the directions because it's kind of interesting how they how, how it opens. Um, but say you have somebody, um, you work in a nursing home, and you have some people in your home in your nursing home that have MS, and you really need to get a better in service for your people. We have a whole booklet that says uh, nursing home care for individuals with multiple cirrhosis. This is just one of many things that we have. We have um, um, uh, booklets for uh, the PA, for nurses. Um, we have this huge little book here, The Use of Disease Modifying and uh, Treatments in Multiple Cirrhosis. This just came out last fall and it's already um, missing one medication, again, the explosion of medications. Um, I have one little piece of paper that just, a little card, of all the different things that uh, you might want to have as well. We have um, this MS um, little quick cheat sheet on this little, plex on this little uh, plastic. Um, and the, the um, McDonald diagnostic uh, card for those of you that are PAs and you want to look to see what what uh, what the criteria would be to diagnose. It, things are changing so rapidly. When I was first with the MS Society, you had to have four lesions um, seen on an MRI, either in the brain or the spine. 
now you can get treatment after two, um, and that's amazing. And that's because we know that these medications work. So um, I kind of, oh, let me see, I think I do have one more time. Here it is, the end. <laughs> so um, Joe did not give me the sign, so that means that we may have a little time for questions, if anybody had one. No? Yes. Do you have, yeah, do you, are there a support, uh, a support groups in Corpus Christi? Because support I, group. I have one. You have one. Yes. Okay, I'd like to, I'd like to get your card and stuff. Because yeah. I, I know some people that are not being supported. And I, they you were, and I, and I saw you shake your head when I said there are no MS specialists. And what's happened is that, you know, they were tired. I think Bonikowski was the one that saw the most down there. And I talked with the uh, director of the Nueces County Physician Society. And they have a big health fair arena. And I always go. And I, I talked to her, Paulette Shaw, weeks ago. Anyway, I talked to her. And she she's going to help me, um, not this year because they were already booked, but she's going to help me <coughs> do some training down there. Um, Dr. Romero, Rebecca Romero, I mentioned her. She's willing to go down there and do some um, some training and um, see what we can do. I mean, I don't. It, it's it, it, shocking that there's um, that no one is down there taking. But it's not that they won't take the patient. It's just that they they don't specialize in MS, and you do have to drill down. Any other questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I Motor trips, and burning lips, and burning toast in the room. How lovely it was. And I want to uh, apologize for the uh, constant, constant interference we're getting from the Beatles. And that Castles on the Rhine, the Parthenon, and moments on the Hudson River line. Many's the time that we feasted.